Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to USVA SOL Review by Standard. Uh, for whatever reason, my computer doesn't want to see my beautiful face today, which for most of you is not a, an issue at all. Uh, so we're going to get right into it. Today we're discussing Standard number 5. We're going to discuss the whole thing. Uh, lots of little things in here, again, uh, including the Articles of Confederation, the Consti Constitutional Convention, Virginia's influence on the Constitution, ratification, and that process, and then the first time, uh, first times that the Supreme Court is tested. So let's get right into it. Here are the standards and the actual language of that. Again, we're looking at this column here. Right, much bigger column. You can see Virginia, a whole lot in there. Again, a whole lot on Virginia. A little bit more, and then the last part here. All right, so five sets of the standard to, uh, and let's get right going into it. So the Articles of Confederation. So after declaring our independence, after uh, winning the the Revolutionary War, we come together and we're like, hey, we need a government. So uh, we're going to get right into that, and uh, we're like, oh, we don't want anything like Britain had. Uh, so we create what's called the Articles of Confederation. Uh, the Articles of Confederation, however, uh, they do provide for a weak national government. We don't want anything like Britain's king uh, and monarchy system, so we're like, no, we're not going to have anything like that. So we're just going to create a legislative branch. However, that legislative branch, a Congress, can not power, has no power to tax. Um, that's an issue, uh, even though we don't like taxes, uh, you know, coming from the British, uh, where they tax us a whole lot. Uh, it's bad because we don't make any money, so that is not good. Uh, we can also not regulate commerce among the states, so different states could have trade imbalances and, and things like that and be making way more money off of uh, other states. Provides for no common currency, so it would be like if you went over to National Harbor, which is not too far from us now, uh, but that's in Maryland, uh, and try having to trade in your Virginia dollars for Maryland dollars. That would not make any sense to you at all. It, it also gave only each state one vote, regardless of its size. So Rhode Island, smallest state in the Union, or what was to become the Union, uh, and Virginia, the biggest state in the Union, only one vote apiece. Uh, so that diminishes the population uh, altogether. Uh, provides for no executive or judicial branch, which I already discussed. So no president-like thing, uh, no Supreme Court-like thing yet. Uh, we're, we're fearful of all that stuff from Britain. So we, we realize that. Uh, we, we realize that the Articles of Confederation provides for a very weak central government, provides for uh, a lot of different issues, and it didn't work. So what we do is we come to back together and say, hey, look, there's a bunch of different issues. The states are getting too much power, especially those small states. So why don't we make federal law and supreme law, uh, or excuse me, the supreme law, uh, and uh, anything else uh, that we don't make law in the federal government can be states, uh, state government, so they can have some power there too. Um, we're going to come together and have a balance between large and small states by creating a two or a bicameral legislature, a two-house legislature with Senate and House of Representatives. One is based on equality among the states. One is based on population. Pretty smart idea there. Uh, we also uh, say, hey, uh, southern states, you can't count your slaves as whole people because you don't even consider them people at all, uh, but you can consider them three-fifths of a person. So the three-fifths compromise comes out of this considering the slave population three-fifths of what it would be if it were white. Other things, uh, it, it avoided a too, power, uh, too powerful central government by establishing three co-equal branches or uh, three separate uh, checks and balances branches, the legislative, executive, and judicial, uh, and they each can check each other. Limits the powers of the federal government to those identified in the Constitution. If it's not in the Constitution, you cannot do it. Okay, let's talk about a couple key leaders here. So George Washington is the president of the convention. Everybody wants him to be at this thing. Uh, he doesn't necessarily want to be there. However, he does eventually come and he presides over the convention. However, he does not have very much input. Uh, he doesn't want to gain all the power. He doesn't want to become the king. 
uh, and many people want him to be that role. He does not. So he comes, he he sort of maintains his, his notoriety, but he doesn't do uh, much other than that. James Madison, on the other hand, a guy from Virginia, is known as the father of the Constitution. Madison um, often leads debates. He kept very extremely detailed notes, uh, and um, where most historians get their ideas about what happened at the Constitutional Convention are from his notes. Uh, at the convention, he also offers the Virginia Plan, which is the major compromise between um, the large and the small states, uh, which provides the three separate uh, branches uh, uh, and, and essentially is what becomes the new government. He also authors the Bill of Rights, which we'll talk about in just a couple of minutes here. All right, let's talk about further Virginia influences here. So George Mason, uh, a local proprietor, proprietor and business owner, uh, plantation owner, he wants to, or he writes the Virginia Declaration of Rights, which is in the Virginia Constitution, and this this influences the, uh, what will become the Bill of Rights, and says that, yeah, you know, governments have a lot of power, however, rights need to be set away for the people of that government. So let's set aside some rights. So that eventually becomes the Bill of Rights. Thomas Jefferson, another famous Virginian, he says, hey, uh, you know, this land is going to be filled with different people from different religions. Uh, why don't we uh, establish something that separates church and state? You know, uh, you know, why don't we get, get rid of that idea, that notion, so that no uh, two major, major powers over people can come together. Uh, so the Virginia Statute of Religious Freedom uh, becomes essentially the groundwork for Article Number, or excuse me, Bill of Right Number One, Amendment Number One to the Constitution, and then the Bill of Rights, like I already mentioned, James Madison authors that Bill of Rights based on a Virginia Declaration of Rights and a Virginia Statute of Religious Freedom, and eventually uh, the Federalists and Anti-Federalists come to agreement on this idea. So it doesn't come without a lot of uh, debate. The Federalists, those supporting the Constitution as is, advocated for a strong central government, saying the Articles of Confederation provided for a much, much weaker government and one that did not work. Um, also, uh, this, this translates into today, where those who see a primary role for the federal government in solving national problems are heirs to this tradition. So you would think of modern liberals uh, in, in the sense that they want bigger government, uh, bigger control of things like health care uh, and the tax code and things like that. Anti-Federalists, on the other hand, feared an overly powerful central government one that was destructive to the rights of individuals. Uh, today, more conservative thinkers echo these concerns and champion liberty, individual initiative, and free market. Uh, this would be the modern conservative Republican groups, uh, those who want uh, government to get completely away. You can obviously see Virginia's uh, uh, much, much biased opinion in this, uh, but we'll digress from that point. Uh, leading Virginia opponents of ratification were Patrick Henry and George Mason. Uh, George Mason, obviously, de you know, developing that Virginia Statute of Rights, uh, Declaration of Rights, excuse me, that's going to influence the Bill of Rights, saying, you know, well, if, if we are going to pass this Constitution with such a strong central government, we need to protect uh, individuals as well. All right, let's talk the last part here about the Supreme Court's first tests. Uh, there's only two that we really, really need to know about, or excuse me, three that we need to know about. Um, judicial review uh, is the idea that the Supreme Court can look at different laws and determine whether they're constitutional or not. That comes out of the Supreme Court case Marbury v. Madison. Um, another one of their powers, the doctrine of implied powers, showing that they do have powers that aren't written in the Constitution, comes out of the Supreme Court case McCullough v. Maryland, and another broadly national view of economic affairs, saying the Supreme Court and event, essentially the central government has uh, say in international, uh, excuse me, interstate commerce comes out of Gibbons v. Ogden. Uh, these are the foundation and the, and the building blocks of the Supreme Court's authority to mediate disagreements between states and the federal government. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that is going to be it for today. Uh, again, you can't see me. Usually I end on, on my positive note here. Um, 
But uh, good luck. I, I'm hoping that this, this really does help you. Uh, and although you can't see me, I'm wishing you good luck and giving you that wink of confidence. All right, good luck. See you again next time.